Good morning. Currently, I am in the midst of teaching confirmation class. And this is something that we usually do about every year, year and a half. Um, we invite our young folks who think that they're about ready to make a commitment to God um, to come to a series of classes that last about eight weeks um, so that they can learn more about what that means. What does it mean to be in a relationship with God and to be a member of his church and his faith community? So I'm going to use one of the lessons that we have used actually just last week as part of the confirmation class as the basis for my sermon this morning. The lesson last week was about grace and how God pours his grace out on us in many different ways. John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Church, felt that there were three specific ways that God poured out his grace upon us. So I'm going to use his illustration in what that grace means and how we experience that grace. The first form of grace is um, a grace called provenient grace. This is like receiving a big invitation from God. So imagine yourself receiving an invitation in the mail. It's a rather fancy invitation, so you know this event must be very special that you're being invited to. You know the host, kind of slightly, more as an acquaintance rather than a close, close friend. But you respect this person. You, you know that they're a fine Christian. You know that they're a good person in the community. And you're a little intimidated. You're not sure that you're in that same league with the person who's invited you to this event. So you are happy to be going. You're excited. You are looking forward to getting to know this person better, but you're still a little nervous because you don't want to embarrass yourself, um, because you don't think that you're quite worthy of this invitation. But nonetheless, you go and you drive to his place, you get out of your car, you start to walk up the pathway, up the sidewalk to the front of the house, and then you get to the front porch. And now it really hits you. What am I doing here? Am I really worthy of this invitation? And you're standing there waiting, ready to ring the doorbell. But you're not real sure that you want to go on in. And this is where um, we are with this provenient grace. God is sitting there. He is waiting for us. He's excited. He wants you to ring the doorbell. He's all ready and waiting just the way um, our host is waiting on the inside of the house. He wants us to come in because he wants us to be part of that circle of friends. He wants us to become comfortable with him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. So as we go ahead and move um, into that ringing the doorbell and moving in, this is that provenient grace. Thinking, knowing that God is always there waiting for you <clears throat> to go ahead and answer his call. The second form of grace is as we actually push that door open and walk in. When we push that door open, we're taking that next step of faith. We're saying to God, I do want to be part of your, part of your family. I do want to be in relationship with you. We are, we're, as we're accepting God then, we're confessing our sins, knowing that he has already forgiven us because Christ has been that sacrifice for us. Christ died on the cross while we were still sinners. That's what he tells us in Romans 8, 5, 8, that he loved us so much, he sent our son, that we, uh, when he died on the cross, our sins were forgiven. So that when we walk into this second step of grace, we walk in and he says, welcome. I want you to be part of my family. You need to know that you can't buy that gift. You can't do enough good works to earn that gift. God gives that grace freely. He gives it to us because he loved us, because we are his children. And because Christ died for us, 
we don't need to do anything but to but accept him to receive that gift of grace poured out for each of us wesley calls this type of grace justifying grace now sometimes when you're working with young people it's hard for them to understand some of these big words that we talk about at church how many of you heard the word provenient grace anywhere besides church we don't say that we're in a provenient relationship it's it's kind of an insider word that we use um, in church justifying grace too we know sometimes that when we justify our actions we are trying to make sure that um, people understand that we we have accepted christ to be justified god says because you are justified he um he makes it just as if i had never sinned that's how we teach it to the kids so that they can break that word down and know that this is a special gift just for them and no matter what they've done before they've come into this relationship with christ as long as they confess their sins and accept christ he makes it just as if they had never sinned before um, so it's a very freeing um, experience to know that your sins are lifted because Christ died for us while we were still sinners, as we know in Romans 5, 8. Um, the next type of grace that we experience, I'm sorry, um, I wanted to share um, Romans passage 5, 1 to 2 here. Therefore, since we have been justified through grace, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus, whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay? So knowing that we have experienced this grace is what gives us that hope that we will be receiving his glory as we move to the next kind of grace that we receive. The third kind of grace is called sanctifying grace. We as Christians, as Methodists in particular, understand that um, this isn't, when we accept Christ, that it doesn't just happen in one instance and, that nev and nothing more happens in our life. It's, it's a life-changing instance when we accept Christ as our Savior and we accept that grace, but that's just the beginning. That's the beginning of our relationship with Christ. To grow that relationship, we need to increase in our prayer life. We need to increase in study and reflection. We need to come to worship so that we can experience his presence with the corporate body. Um, we need to participate in other activities that continue to help us learn and grow about Christ. So coming to youth group for the young people, um, coming to Bible study for the adults, these are all ways that you can continue to grow in your, your faith life and grow in that relationship um, that you have with Christ. We did a couple of activities, or we've done several activities as we've gone through the confirmation class that um, to help kids realize what some of this stuff means. Because sometimes it's a little hard for them to catch the full concept of what it means to live in relationship with God and to grow your faith. Early on in one of the lessons when we were learning about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit becomes that active part in our lives that we can hear God's message and know what his plan is for us, we did an activity where we actually have 13 kids going through confirmation class this year, and I think that that's just absolutely fabulous that we have such a large group. Um, being on the district, on the Northwest District as the lay leader there too, I will tell you that there are churches that don't take in any new people in several years. And we are blessed that we have had um, quite large groups of confirmation classes over the last three or four years. One of the activities, though, that we did with them early on about the Holy Spirit, half of them were blindfolded. And we were actually back in where old, the whole, old Holy Grounds would, is, because our class is right in the library there. Half of them were standing over at the far end, near the steps to go upstairs. The other half were standing over by the library. And the half that were over by the steps to go upstairs were blindfolded. The other ones over at the other end were the people giving directions. 
Now I had some shapes that I passed out. Um, they were different colors and different shapes and I placed them on the floor randomly around the room after we had the kids blindfolded. So they had no idea where their shape was. The ones giving directions were said, were told to direct their partner to the red circle or the orange square or the pink triangle so they knew exactly what destination they were taking that person. Now you have to know that I didn't give them a straight path to their object. So if one was standing over here, probably ended up over there somewhere at the other end of the room to find the object that they were going to. Now this would have been really easy if I would have said to each of the ones giving directions, all of you need to be quiet while this one gives directions. And then all of you need to be quiet while this one gives directions. Not so easy. Our Christian life is not so easy either. So they were all shouting directions to their partner at the same time. So you can imagine there are six of them shouting directions, there are six of them trying to get where they need to be, and none of them are going down a straight path. The people that were blindfolded then had to listen very carefully to try to pick out that one voice out of the crowd to be able to successfully navigate from one end of the room to the other to their designated destination. This is what happens to us sometimes too when we're in that busy hubbub of life and we're having fun with our friends and we're making life decisions about where we want to be in our job, in our location, in our home, where do we want to live, where do we want to um, rest and go on vacation. There's a lot of chaos that goes on in our lives and sometimes it's hard to hear the voice of God in all of the chaos that's going on in our lives. So in those times, it's important to listen carefully, to spend time in prayer with God so that you can figure out what his plan for your life is, to study and read his word so that you can experience his word on the written page and apply that to your life too to help you along your pathway. We also did an activity last week that we used modeling clay. And this modeling clay was to illustrate that God molds us, makes us, and transforms us into the people he wants us to be. And the first part of the activity, they were only allowed to mold the first, only half of the clay. The rest of the clay was, they couldn't break it off mold one half and try to put it back together with the other half. The challenge was that God is always with us trying to mold us and make us while we become who we are. So they found that activity a little challenging because they really wanted to pull the clay apart. Um, the other thing that we did last week is we took another walk and this was a trust walk. And um, the writer of this material must like blindfolds because we had them blindfolded last week too. And the first thing I asked them when we came into class was, who wants to go on a trip? And so, of course, you know, about half of their hands went up, which was what I was hoping for. Um, I didn't tell them that they were gonna be blindfolded to go on the trip. They were a little more nervous about that when I mentioned that they were going to be blindfolded. And then I took the rest of the class out into the lobby because I wanted to give them directions about where we were going to go. Because this, this experience was going to be considerably different than the loud shouting experience that we had had before. So I brought them out into the lobby and I told them that our destination was to bring them down through the main lobby here, through the hospitality center and that we were going outside. And so, got everybody ready, and the next challenge was they could only speak in a small voice or whisper to their partner. And they weren't supposed to touch their partner unless their partner was going to run into a person or an object. And so they were a little nervous about the fact that we were going to be moving 
right as this service left out, people were coming in for Sunday school, people were coming in for the next service, so it wasn't going to be, again, a quiet, clear path for them to give directions um, to their partner. So we started off back at the, the, um, the library, and they gave their partners directions to come out into the lobby there, come down the ramp, cross by the mailboxes, down the ramp again, through the lobby, and then down the long ramp in the hospitality center, and then out the doors, and we ended up um, going out the door to the right and coming up into that little courtyard where the bell is. And that's where we ended our activity. Now, after we got done with the activity, I, we spent some time talking with those that were blindfolded about how their experience would have changed, what could have been done to change their experience to give them more confidence. Did they feel like they had gotten enough direction from their guide to get where they were going? Some of them felt like they didn't really, it was when the, the voice was low and we got out in his, to the lobby where there was a lot of activity, they felt a little more uncertain about how to navigate through that activity. Most of them are pretty used to the church, so they know the layout. They knew that they had moved down the ramps and they could feel that they were in the lobby, but they knew that when they were in the lobby, there were people moving around. And so it was a little less comfortable for them knowing that they might bump into somebody on the way down. Now you have to know when you work with young people, when they walk out of this building, they don't usually use the ramps. Um, they take the steps, and these steps up here, they probably take in one step because there are only two of them. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the hospitality center, and they take those in one step also because they come in a flying leap off of there and jump down into the, to the Holy Grounds area, the hospitality area. So for them to take a longer route on the ramps was probably a little unfamiliar to them, especially the long ramp down here in the hospitality center. Um, so moving down there, knowing that they were closed in on both sides, um, but they, and they knew there was a turn, but they didn't know how close they were to the turn. Taking them outside, once they got outside, I don't think that they felt as comfortable because there's lots of directions you can go outside. Most of them go into the parking lot, go over toward the playground. They don't usually come up into that little um, quiet area between the main church and the education wing. So it was a little more interesting when they got out there. I could see one of the boys was very, very anxious because his partner would say, turn to your left, and he would take like five steps. And so then he would have to back him up because it's a very small area and he had overshot where he needed to go. So then he would tell him to turn to the right, and again he would take five steps and was off the, the path that way. Sometimes that's what happens to us in our faith journey too. God has kind of a plan for us, but we turn and we get off of his plan. Then we try to correct and we turn and get off of his plan in the other direction. Um, and he keeps trying to pull us back onto his path. One of the things that we talked about with the guides was, how comfortable were you giving the directions quietly knowing it was hard for them to hear? Would it have been easier for you just to take them by the hand and lead them out through and down the pathway outside? How many times do you think God feels like that? that it would just be easier for him if we would submit to his will, let him take us by the hand and lead us. But that's where free will comes in. God gives us free will to move about in our culture, in our community, in our daily life as we go. But always remembering that he is with us every step of the way giving us guidance every step of the way. Our job is to listen to him. Let him come into our lives. 
Let him strengthen our lives and be the Lord of our life so that when we're in those times of chaos, when we're going on our journey and we stumble and we fall, we are tempted. Bad things happen in our lives. And sometimes we question if we can hear God in those bad times. You can hear God, but you have to listen. You have to feel that nudging as you go. Sometimes that nudging comes from family. Sometimes that nudging comes from friends. Sometimes that, is, that nudging comes from people that you worship with on a Sunday morning or you study with in a Bible study. God is at work in all things and in all people who um, accept him as Lord and Savior. And they will help to get you back on that path as we go along. <clears throat> so the last form of grace is known as sanctifying grace. It's in that sanctifying grace that God wants us to explore our faith, explore our pathways. But in that exploration, he's going to be with you every step of the way, guiding you, leading you as you let him. Growing closer in that relationship to God will help you hear him a whole lot clearer. And that's what we're trying to tell the young po folks as we're taking them through this confirmation process, that God will always be with you everywhere you go, even in those times when you have friends that are doing things that you know you shouldn't be a part of. God is there. He will give you the strength to overcome those situations. And when we do stumble and fall, God will be with, there, with us to lift us up and bring us back onto the pathway. That always reminds me of the parable of the good shepherd. You know, the good shepherd had, was tending his sheep, brought them into the fold for the night, was doing a head count, and realized he was missing one. He didn't just say, oh, well, there's that crazy lost sheep. He'll come back when he gets hungry. No, he was proactive. He went out searching the nooks, the crannies, the hollows, um, the streams to find that lost sheep. When he found that lost sheep, he picked the sheep up, put him on his shoulders, and joyfully carried him all the way back to bring him into the fold. This is what God does with us when we try stumble and fall as well. He doesn't just let us hanging out there on our own. He comes in search of us, again, using those people in our lives sometimes to nudge us, to get us back into the fold. And then he's wonderfully happy. He joyfully celebrates when we are back where we belong, in, his, in a relationship with him and with our faith family. So as I bring the message to a close, I'd like to ask you, how are you experiencing this grace? Are you standing on the porch? Are you waiting to push that doorbell? If you are, know that God has already accepted you as one of his children. He is anxiously awaiting you to move to that next step and commit your life to Christ. As you enter that door, he reminds you that you're justified in your faith. He justifies us, and because Christ died for us and for our sins, we are made just as if we had never sinned before. And he's very happy. Are you in that relationship with Christ? Are you exploring? Is your faith being sanctified? Are you walking with him in your daily walk, feeling his presence with you, feeling his love, feeling his grace as you move through your daily life? That's what God wants. He wants to be in relationship with you so that he can always be guiding us, protecting us every day, every way everywhere we go. So as, as we are thinking about our faith 
and our grace. Wanting to let you know that this is a glorious time. You can experience God's glory if you just let him in. Let him into your life. Let him pour out that grace upon you and lead your daily steps. Thank you.